We must now move to questions to the Minister for Education. And just to inform members that question number seven has been withdrawn. So, Iram Sir Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, the Department is making significant progress on the delivery of the campus, which remains on track for the planned opening in September uh, 2020. Construction of the first school on site, uh, Arvillee School and Resource Centre, was completed in the summer with the school opening on the uh, 6th of September. Site wide demolition has also been completed. Designs for the other five schools and facilities will reach the detailed design stage this autumn. Procurement of an integrated supply team to uh, further develop and construct the campus will begin later this year. I had the opportunity, I think, and on my first week as Minister to be able to see the site for myself at Oma and I can see the, the direct progress and see the, uh, the design work that is, is going on and also uh, view at that stage the slightly incompleted um, construction of, of Arvillee but it was very close to completion at that point and I intend uh, actually I will be visiting the site uh, tomorrow. I should also indicate the Department is working with Transport NI to progress the Strathroy uh, Link Road project, which is a key element of the campus uh, traffic management solution. The procurement process for the uh, contractor is underway, with construction work scheduled to commence uh, early next year. Further traffic management measures will be required at the Gorton, uh, Gorton Road side of the site, and the public uh, consultation um, has commenced. The Department submitted detailed information on a range of reserve matters to the local planning authority, which is the uh, from Ananoma Council in July. Uh, and I should also indicate that a memorandum of agreement setting out arrangements for ownership, governance and management of the campus uh, has been agreed with managing authorities and work has started to develop an education model and funding arrangements for the campus. Mr McAleer, supplementary. Um, uh, very much welcome progress on the site. Indeed, this is very much welcomed by everyone in the district and the master role. Indeed, the minister preempted the question around the Strathroy link. However, I will ask the question. Uh, this is a very, very substantial project in the region of about 140 million, and it's been advertised in the European uh, Journal. I wonder, could the minister tell me, is what steps can his department take to ensure that local firms and local tradespeople can get employment opportunities as part of this project? Graham Agat. I think. Um it is the case. I mean, I, I welcome sort of. I've, I've preempted the, the member. I'll try in future not to give as much information in the uh, initial answer. Um, but I think the, the program itself, I think, creates significant uh, opportunities for the construction industry, the business, and the community sector. Uh, for instance, the contract for phase one, which was the construction uh, of Arvale School and Resource Centre, was awarded to Woodville Construction Limited, uh, an open-based contractor, and as most. As a friend of mine would say, every day is a school day. Uh, until I went down there, I assumed that that was a, uh, a firm from North West Belfast, but it's, it's an OMA based contractor. And the contract was completed in mid August 2016 and has provided employment and subcontracting opportunities for business in the OMA area, as well as a range of social returns and bespoke uh, local community events. Moving forward, all future contracts associated with this development will be advertised and promoted through the normal channels. And that will facilitate contractors and businesses to consider the opportunities afforded. Furthermore, further contracts will be adopting the bi-social uh, principles, which are supported by the commitment to include social clauses in public procurement. Construction supply chain and community engagement will be facilitated through a range of activities such as meet the buyer events. So we're very much trying to encompass the, the whole community and provide that, those opportunities for local people to be directly involved. Iram, sir. Daniel McCrossan. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, I too welcome the development of the Sewell campus and thank you for your detailed progress report to this House. Can the Minister outline what his department's plans are for the existing sites following the relocation and does he have plans to utilise these sites to the benefit of the local community and to the local economy? Well, obviously, in terms of the, uh, the local sites, um, the existing sites have different sort of ownership arrangements. Uh, so three of the sites, for instance, belong to the Education Authority. The remaining three are under the ownership of individual voluntary trust groupings. Uh, my department always has in place arrangements for the disposal of school sites within the ownership of the EA. That's in line with the, the guidance for uh, disposal of public assets in Northern Ireland. And disposal of those sites will be a matter of the other sites will be a matter for trustees. However, I'm acutely aware, I take very much on board what the member has said, 
that the future use of these sites is very of strategic importance, uh, in particular to the wider economic development of Oma Town, indeed in the surrounding areas. Therefore, in the, I'm in the process of establishing a working group to, estab to examine the issues ahead of 2020, and the group will be made up of representatives, uh, including, for instance, the owners of the sites. It will be made up with representatives from Fermanagh uh, and Oman District Council, and also uh, representatives from the uh, relevant government agencies, because I think we're conscious of the fact that, that while we've got a very exciting project um, at Struhl, we also want to make sure that th there is the best possible use made of the available land, uh, because I think that can also create an economic regeneration for the, the wider community, and I think that's something that, that all of us would embrace. And I think we'd move forward very much on a sense of partnership with that. Call Chris Little. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask uh, the Minister why, despite a uh, target for the programme for government 2011 to 15 to have all children in shared education programmes, by 2015 only 2.5 per cent of pupils had the opportunity, and why there are no specific targets for shared or integrated education in the programme for government for 2016 to 2021? Well, I mean, I could go through the historic reasons in relation to that, uh, but from a practical point of view, you mentioned about the programme for government. Obviously, the member is aware that we're still at draft stage of the programme for government. Nothing is actually written in stone. So we want to actually attach both targets and indeed delivery uh, within that. Now, I think we have seen, it is fair to say, also significant progress in terms of shared education, also integrated education, both through the capital uh, availability of the Fresh Start money, uh, also through the amount of support that's being given to shared education uh, through the shared education programmes that are being funded for example, not just by the Department of Education, but also the Executive Office and, the, uh, and also through Atlantic Philanthropies. But most importantly, I think what we are starting to see, and particularly if you're looking at construction, it does take a, a reasonable length of time, we're actually seeing boots on the ground and actually pure delivery. And indeed, I think that what we will see in OMA will become a, a shining example uh, for an efficient use of, of um, public resources and indeed something which will, which will embrace sharing across, across the way. So, it is work in progress. Uh, I appreciate that we have not reached that point as fast as we should have done in that regard, but I think it's something that will need to be encompassed as part of the wider and final um, programme for government whenever it eventually does emerge. Call Tom Buchanan. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, will the control sector support body be involved in a working group to dispose of the assets? I think from that point of view, we're looking at members representing all the different sectors. And I think it's important uh, that what we see is we see buy-in across, and I think the control sector has an important role to play uh, within that. Ownership doesn't lie with the, con with the control sector support body. In the same way, also, the ownerships of the sites uh, that are outside the EA don't lie, for instance, with uh, CCMS. It's the, it's the trustees. But I think what we want to ensure that if we're looking at, at how we move things forward in terms of the sites, that there's as a, a wide a community buy-in as possible, and that involves the various sectors, it also involves directly local representatives through the uh, Fermanagh and Oman Council on a cross-party basis, and also all the relevant uh, government agencies. Iram Sir, Michaela Boy. Gail Scully Doherty, which I think is the correct pronunciation. If, if I'm getting nodding approval of Barry McElduff, I know. <laughs> I've either done something very right or very wrong, if I'm getting, if I'm getting nodding approval of Barry Doherty. It was one of the 18 major capital investment programmes which was included in the Department's January 2013 announcement. Since that time, protracted work has been undertaken to identify and assess the technical feasibility of suitable sites for this school in the Straban area. A business case outlining uh, estimated expenditure of £3.35 million on this project uh, to provide a new seven-classroom uh, school and nursery unit was approved earlier this year. And I'm pleased to advise that the site has now been secured at, at Strahan Roads uh, and the, uh, the purchase has taken place. These significant developments will enable the progression of the scheme to the next stage of procuring an integrated uh, consultation team to take the project forward to design and beyond. Supplementary, Ms Boyle. Can I thank the Minister for his uh, welcoming response? Minister, given that um, this sector has had concerns, um, particularly since you took up post, that you have already rejected a number of development proposals, uh, and I welcome the news that you have said today, but can you confirm, Minister, that this sector will be given 
um, the same priority as other sectors and will not be disadvantaged? Gormagut. I will be treating everybody entirely on the merit of the proposals. Now, obviously, a capital build is in a different situation from a development proposal. But in terms of development proposals, I will treat each development proposal on its own merits, and I think that legally is the position that, uh, that has to happen in any event on it. So I will treat everything with the, the merit that is there, and I will try, therefore, to reach decisions on, on that basis. And I don't think any sector is anything either to look forward to or fear. I, I see, obviously, I've, I've clearly excited some level of, of interest within different sectors at, at, at times on it, but I would try and treat every development proposal on its own merits. I call Joanne Dobson. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, will he undertake to review new build projects, especially for schools in the Dixon Plan area? I'll be looking in terms of new build projects across the board. In terms of capital announcements, uh, I mean, I should indicate, I've, I've already indicated in terms of the Dixon Plan that I see the Dixon Plan continuing on and being secure in that regard. We are in a position in terms of uh, new build uh, that I will want, first of all, to try to ensure that whatever we're doing, we get the best possible value for public money. And in many cases, that will involve new build. In other cases, it may well be looking at what is best to be delivered on the ground, sometimes in terms of, in terms of sharing. At the moment, while I would anticipate that the capital side of things as regards financing may be a little bit easier over the next few years compared to the resource side, at the moment, there's no determination that's been made on the, the ongoing budget. So I'm not in a position, for instance, to make any announcements today in relation to new capital build. However, I think we want to have as much investment as we possibly can in the school estate and do it in an efficient way as possible, which means that, that every project will be carefully scrutinised in that regard. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in this age of equality, how will he, as Minister, and ensure that the decision-making within his department covers and provides for all sectors of education? Uh, I think, particularly as we're in what are straightened financial circumstances. Uh, we, it is important that we have both a, a, sense, a clear sense of fairness and equality across all sectors, particularly when it comes to capital build, to try to ensure um, that we are getting the best possible value. And, and what that will mean in some cases will be to say, actually, that a capital build, a new capital build, may not be the most appropriate, looking at what existing resources and seeing, particularly as we're moving towards a situation of sharing in which there's greater level of, of getting the, the maximum return for that. I'm aware of the statutory duties, particularly there are statutory duties that are placed in terms of Irish medium and integrated education, and I'll be fulfilling those, but also trying to be as fair as possible to, to all sectors, because, again, where there is any form of perceived bias within the system where people are seeing different schools getting treated in different ways, then that's actually where it can create a, a level of concern. Sometimes that's justified and sometimes it's not, but I'll be trying to make sure that all sectors are treated fairly on that basis. I call Jim Allister. In his previous role, the minister rightly observed that under the vast mandate, there had been disproportionate funding on capital of Irish medium schools. He pointed out the Irish medium sector only has 1.3% of the school population, but had over 12% of the capital pr projects. Now that he has control of the, project, uh, of the purse strings, will we see reversal? Of that bias? I would hope to see actually that there's no bias at all in any of the decisions that, that I'll be making. I'll be ensuring that as we move forward, and I would anticipate, whereas I can't be very specific over the amounts of capital build that will happen and indeed new calls, I'll be making sure that all capital calls are entirely on a fair and objective basis and that all sectors are treated equally in that regard. That it's actually the merits of the build which become the significant key factor and indeed what contribution to get the, the best possible value for the public, public sector. And that will apply irrespective of the sector that it applies to. I call Stuart Dixon. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Um, the percentage of the 2016-17 uh, education budget currently allocated to the aggregate schools budget is actually just over 60%. It's, it's slightly moved up proportionately, uh, I think, because of the, some of the other reductions. Uh, there is always, when one is quoting statistics, any government statistics, uh, always a slight degree of caveat to be added to that. On top of the 60% that's in the aggregated schools budget, there's around about an additional 12% of the overall 16-17 budget is allocated to schools from centre budgets held by the Education Authority, with a, with a further 13% attributable to services to them. So there's about 85% goes directly into some form of school budget uh, funding. So, for example, 
Um, all special schools are paid for directly out of the block grant that, that comes to education authority. Um, the classroom assistants are not paid through the aggregated schools budget, home to school transport, and those have obviously been fairly substantial funds. It is, however, uh, while adding that caveat, it's my intention as Education Minister to give greater freedom and autonomy to schools over the, how they spend their budget. I want to do that in a considered way to see actually how we can get uh, a level of advantage to have that level, greater level of autonomy. And so over the next few months, I will be uh, giving that some consideration. And I would also indicate that I believe that what is being delivered directly in schools, you know, there's a lot of things that are very worthy within education. But I would regard, if you like, the frontline delivery within schools as being uh, the key priority. And so I will give prioritisation to schools funding within future budget allocations. And I'll continue to argue in the executive within the constraints of the overall Northern Ireland budget for additional funding for schools where possible. Uh, supplementary, Mr Dixon. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I want to appreciate what the Minister has uh, informed the House. Um, can he tell us why he doesn't appear to have the same level of confidence in school principals uh, and school boards of governors in Northern Ireland as his uh, colleagues in England, Scotland and Wales do, where they have traditionally uh, given much higher uh, percentage of departmental budgets to schools in order for them to administer locally? Because, after all, governors and school principals should know best in terms of how to deliver for their local schools. I have, I have every confidence uh, the member will realise that in terms of the distribution of funding, that is not something which can simply happen overnight. It's also something which needs to be carefully thought through. We're in a situation in Northern Ireland of about 1.8 million people. We've also got to look where there are direct economies of scale, but also give that opportunity for schools to be able to spend a greater percentage of their budget. The direction of travel in terms of the percentage share of spend of the overall education budget will be upwards uh, while I'll be minister in terms of what can be directly spent by schools. We've also got to realise, to be fair, that sometimes when we're comparing Northern Ireland with England, for example, there is a very different school system within England that has evolved over many years on it. And also, to some extent, and this is true of almost any form of statistics, you're not always absolutely comparing like, like with like. And so, for example, uh, we have a situation that I think 85 million is spent on classroom assistance. That is spent directly in classrooms on that basis but it doesn't appear in the line for the aggregated schools budget. So we've got to make sure that whenever we're talking about uh, levels of school spent and school autonomy, that we are talking on a, on a similar basis in that, in that regard. OK, just to remind members, if they wish to speak to please stand, or for those that have provision made, please do uh, let us know. OK, I call Aaron Fair, Colin McGrath. Call Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister agree with me that it is difficult for principals to effectively budget in area learning communities when some of the funding has to be claimed retrospectively? And could he undertake an investigation in this to ensure that there isn't risk taken by principals and all support that can be offered to them is offered to them? What I would indicate that, that um, whereas we could never have a situation, there's always a, a possibility of some bolt out of the sky in terms of, in terms of funding. I want to try and make sure that whatever announcements are made, and even if this means taking a little bit longer time, whatever announcements are made, be it either in terms of capital or resources that I make, are then stood over on that basis. I think the one thing we want to avoid as much as possible is uncertainty. If there is a particular problem in terms of area learning communities, in terms of receiving their money later, having to claim it back retrospectively, that's something I'd be very happy to look into and see how we can move that forward for 2017-18 um, onwards. Call Philip Logan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister if he has any plans then to uh, review the, uh, the common funding formula? The common funding formula and associated formula funding arrangements are kept under uh, constant review. There was, I think, the, the previous occasion, uh, there was an independent review in 2013. But what I, th what I want to try to ensure, particularly as we're left, that I mentioned earlier about the capital side, where there may be a little bit more flexibility, but there's no doubt. Anybody in education, particularly in schools, will tell you that resource funding is very tight at the moment. What I will want to do is to try to ensure to examine the common funding for it, to make sure that it's fit for purpose, that where money is actually happening, that it's going in the right way and getting the maximum amount of advantage. So it will be something I'll be keeping under review to see, to try and ensure that the best possible support is given to schools across the board. Aaron, sir, Barry McElduff, called uh, Barry McElduff. Cora Mayogut, alias Ken Colia, thank you. Can I ask the Minister? if he would have any message for school principals today who are feeling the pressure of reduced school budgets 
and the possibility of the loss of teaching posts and you know, bigger sized classrooms. Is there any good news emanating from the Department and the Minister on that front? Well, I'd always quite like to be the Minister for good news. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. I'm working on the situation and I would hope to be in a position in the near future to be able to give some level of additional support to schools from within the budget. Um, people have always got to remember that any money that is then going to schools from within the budget is being cut elsewhere. So I think we've got to make sure that we don't have our, our cake and eat it. And I think the prioritisation of trying to retain as many jobs as possible, I think, will be the key focus as well as we move ahead. Uh, but I hope to be able to say something in the near future as regards that, that issue. I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his determination in, ter in terms of making sure that uh, the Department gives more control over their budgets to the schools. Um, I just wondered, Minister, when you're looking at this review, have you a timetable plan in mind to execute it? In terms of, um, I think in terms of any short-term action I can take within 1617, I hope to be able to announce that reasonably soon. In terms of other uh, more strategic issues, I will want to take a little bit of time to do that because I think, more importantly, it's important to get things right in that regard. I think the other factor which will be critical in moving forward in terms of the level of support that we can give schools will be getting a clearer understanding as we move ahead of the 17-18 budget because that shows the level of room for manoeuvre that, that are there. But, you know, I have no doubt that we have a lot of um, particularly school principals who are trying to manage their budget under very difficult circumstances, the vast bulk of them doing it in a very responsible fashion. But I want to see what additional help can be given to them. Now, I'm not going to be able to, in the short term, be able to promise miracles, but there will be, I think, some help, hopefully, that will be given in the near future uh, directly to schools. I call Palm Cameron. Uh, preschool education, while it's non compulsory, is an important phase of early education. If, preschool, if a preschool setting, either statutory or non statutory is oversubscribed, it will apply admissions criteria in order of priority. And the preschool education providers set the admissions criteria. There is some evidence which shows that children from socially disadvantaged uh, circumstances tend to experience more difficulty at school than others. And so there has been a priority given uh, within preschool's admissions as part of a wider effort to try and tackle education under, under achievement. I will want to look at that relatively closely to ensure that from the point of view of where we're using definitions of children from socially disadvantaged circumstances in terms of priority, that those are the right definitions, so there may well be an examination of that. But also I think that we do have a situation where in terms of preschool provision, it has moved on from the original position, which there was effectively a very much a rationed situation. We've now moved much more closely to a situation where at least pretty much every child has the opportunity for some level of preschool uh, education. And I think I want to take that into account as well to see whether the original intentions are now being delivered in a fit-for-purpose way. But if it does arise for, that I'm looking for any proposed changes, those will, those will be subject to, any, to public consultation. OK, supplementary. Ms Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr De Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer um, so far. Could the Minister just tell me whether he agrees with me that the criteria which um, gives automatic admission to those who are claiming benefits um, disadvantages those parents or guardians that um, are working parents? That's an issue I think I would want to take a look at. And I think we want to be in a position that we don't see particular families disadvantaged, particularly where there are working parents in that regard. Now, I think there was a very um, – the right focus whenever a lot of this was brought in was in a situation in which there was a scarcity of places. We've now moved to a situation in which, for example, in terms of preschool places, about 87 per cent of people got their first choice. Uh, and we're in a situation where roughly about 92 per cent of people are actually directly applying. And indeed, in terms of obtaining places, it's 99.9 per .9 cent now are getting some form of place. So we've got to make sure just the system is, is fit for purpose. I think the other allied issue as well, and there has been, I suppose, to be fair, the Department in recent years has built in a, a certain level of a little bit more flexibility in terms of the preschool places side of things. We have a situation that if you're looking across the board, there is a good argument that says within Northern Ireland we have roughly the right number of preschool places if we're getting 99.9% .9 of people obtaining a place. I suppose the issue is to what extent is there some level of geographical disjoint as place as well. So you get what might be described as hot spots where there's oversubscription and other areas where there's maybe a, um, a need that there wouldn't be quite the same pressure in terms of places. So I think it's about aligning that, that side of things as well. I call Andy Allen. 
Lying whether he is aware of any shortage of preschool places in East Belfast and any plans or proposals he ha- may have to address this? In terms of the individual circumstances of East Belfast, uh, I do not have those figures directly to hand. Across the board, there has tended to be a, uh, an overall levelling off of, of provision. But what I want to establish within that is, as I said, whether we have any level of hotspots. Now, one of the things that has been the case, um, until relatively recently, there was a situation in which the numbers were entirely capped, that, that you couldn't move, for instance, beyond 26. What is the, the point is that from learning to learn was introduced um, in 2013, and sometimes there's maybe not 100 per cent aware of this. There is a situation where the schools themselves or the nursery units can uh, basically ask for temporary variations of flexibility up to four additional places. Um, now, that comes, it's not something which is filtered through the EA or the department to make the approach. It's coming from uh, the preschool groups themselves. In terms of that, for instance, in this year, across Northern Ireland, there's been 142 additional places approved to date on that side of things. But I'll get back to the members regards the specific details of East Belfast. The Interim Secretary, Jennifer McCann. Can I ask the Minister, just in, in terms of your last answer to the member, you mentioned about the criteria widening the criteria in terms of um, for to make it wider. But I know priority has to be given to those families that are most disadvantaged and in need. But I know that, that in the last ma- mandate that there was a call to look at working family tax credits actually being um, considered in terms of because they are benefits and they are families that are really you know, are low income families even though they are working. So has the Minister any plans to widen that to include the working family tax credits? In the point of view of widening, I am relatively open minded as to how we take things forward. That. I want to try and ensure that what we have in terms of uh, prioritisation is fit for purpose. So I want to look at this in the wider context, and that might involve, for example, uh, whether it's working tax credits and that sort of things. I mean, don't forget we're in a situation where there is in the process of welfare reform, so we'll need to probably have some level of examination of what the qualifiers for any of these things are anyway on that, that basis. I want to take a wider look at this and ensure that uh, anything I'm doing is an evidence-based so that we're not getting a situation where some parents are being, uh, feel that they are, they are losing out uh, and others are gaining. It's, it's got to be, if there's prioritisation, it's got to be something that is directly fit for purpose. But I'm not going to prejudge any examination of that. But I want to, whether it's a question of widening, whether it's a question of changing the definition, I'm open minded in terms of the route that that takes. Call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister mentioned uh, 99.9% getting places, but he'd be aware of a particular problem with those with special education needs. Could I ask him what he's doing to increase? provision for those with special education needs? Well, in terms, in in terms of the nursery Strangler. provision, on that, and I, I suspect it might have uh, beaten the honourable member for, you might have beaten the honourable member for East Belfast to the punch on that particular point. Uh, the Education Authority is doing a strategic review of that. Now, it's critical uh, that there was a particular increase in numbers this year, which had to then to be catered for. Uh, the overall Education Authority review will try and put something in place which is much more fit for purpose for 17-18. Uh, Within that, that will also involve, for instance, not just the input of the department and others, but particularly both a a parent stakeholder group. It will involve um, a group of professionals to give advice to that. And as we move towards a a situation in terms of timescale, I think we're looking at a report uh, sort of initially appearing and then so it can be fully implemented. I think it will be with the department, the eventual report in March of, of 2017 with then hopefully full implementation if that is something that is fit for purpose for September 1718 onwards. So it's, it's important we actually get this sort of provision right and get it sort of in a more long term manner right than inevitably we, at times we will have to make uh, and the education authority in terms of their placements will have to move in sometimes quickly to particular circumstances to try and provide additional support. Uh, but I think it's important that we actually do it in a much more strategic way, if, if possible, so that hopefully some of the problems which have arisen don't arise again. That ends the period for listed questions, and we'll now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. And as topical question number one has been withdrawn, I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I uh, ask the Minister, in light of the numbers of people that have increased for St. Columbanus College in Bangor, has the Minister any plans to increase temporary classrooms? Yeah. Now, I'm, aware, I'm aware of the, particularly of the uh, very 
active interest, of, sorry, definitely locating the member. I'm aware of the active interest. I know that the, the members lobbied very strongly on this issue. Uh, and there's obviously, if, if you like, a longer term issue for St Colin Banas, in many ways being the victim of its success in terms of the sheer volume of people who are, who are uh, looking in. But in terms of temporary provision, I understand that the school has been provided with two additional mobile classrooms for the 16 17 year. Those are due uh, for completion very soon. And there will also, I think, due to be two additional modular class, uh, classrooms in time for the 17-18 years. Now, officials from the estate's operations team have been working closely with the school to address accommodation needs, and I think are due to meet the, uh, the school principal uh, tomorrow, actually, to discuss uh, potential future minor works. So that could well be. I was able, we were able to announce a certain amount of investment in the minor works over the summer period. And in terms of minor works over the last five years, and I appreciate for a lot of schools, this will be a poor substitute for ultimately a decision on new build. But over the last five years, the school has received investment of around about 1.3 million on various projects um, involving minor works, which cover a range of things, such as not just the temporary classrooms, but uh, things like window replacement, lift, toilet refurbishment, changing room re uh, refurbishment, the mobile classrooms themselves, partial rewiring, uh, concrete repairs, and road barrier installation. Supplementary, Mr. Easton. Thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister, does he believe that the temporary classrooms will definitely be in place for next year because there will be an, an, an increase in numbers again? Is that a definite? Well, we're in a position, again, uh, I want to be in a position that where there are direct announcements, it's then done with a degree of, of definite. But the original intention, I think, following a, a scoping exercise, and appreciate in terms of numbers, supposed to give people a, a remember that there's been an approval a while ago of the enrolment in a phased manner from about 525 to an eventual position in 2025 of 750. Now, following a scoping exercise by the Education Authority, a double modular unit to be used as general classrooms, it was originally due to be on site for the start of September. The advice that we've got from the Education Authority that will be in place in mid-September, so it is literally happening in the next few days. Similarly, I think in terms of the 2017-18 year, uh, we are going to work closely with the school and the EA in terms of the further double mobile uh, for that to be in place for September 2017. And whereas I appreciate neither will provide a long term solution, they will at least ease a certain level of the, the burden on the school. And I know, uh, having met with the, the member and representatives of the school, uh, I think we had a very useful discussion on this, this issue to try to provide that level of alleviation. Uh, Minister, are you concerned uh, at the level of opposition being expressed by principals, teachers, um, parents, trade unions and indeed some churches, um, given your decision to reverse departmental policy to allow teachers to mentor primary school children on the transfer test? In terms of preparation of the, of the children, because obviously it's up to the individual parents to enter their, their own children. Look, I think from that point of view, there is no doubt, there's no other education issue which I could pick out here, which uh, there isn't a greater division of opinion on, both within society as a whole and within this, this House. Uh, mentioned about concern about the level of opposition. I'm actually quite heartened by the amount of people of all those different groups who've actually been in touch with me at times to say this is actually the right way forward. In particular, I'm heartened by the number of parents who've been in contact at various levels, people even just I've run into in the street and in other places who are, are very happy with the decision that is there. I appreciate the nature of this decision is going to be one which, irrespective of whether it was me making the decision or it was the previous minister making the decision, there would be people who will be opposed to it. I think that what we're, we've got to do actually is reflect the reality of the situation. Now, there is a division on the issue of, uh, the issue of selection and the transfer test. But it is also the case that, irrespective of our own individual views on that, it is something which is legally allowable. It is something which is happening. It is clearly something that has happened, is here to stay on that basis. And I think that uh, allowing schools, mention was made, I think, by Mr. Dixon earlier about the issue of autonomy within schools. This is essentially a memo which is permissive in its nature. And actually, to be perfectly honest, permissive to actually bring out into the open and what has been happening in an awful lot of schools behind closed doors up until now. They've not been admitting it necessarily to the Department of Education, uh, but the kind of preparation that, that is ongoing is something uh, which is, is happening at present. This allows actually, to be honest, simply the threat to be removed. And if I can remove threats from schools 
then that, I believe, is actually a, a, an important step forward, and I think one which a lot of people in Northern Ireland will strongly welcome. Supplementary, Ms. Boyle. Uh, Margaret, can I thank the Minister for his response? Minister, what guarantees can you offer to those pupils and indeed parents of pupils who are not undergoing the transfer test um, that they will not be sidelined um, or left behind if teachers do decide um, to, to prepare those who want to sit the transfer test in valuable class time? Gormagat? Yes. First of all, I have great faith in schools to actually provide sensible solutions within this. Again, I am not compelling a single school to do anything. It is up to the schools themselves to do it. And I would reiterate as well, this is something which is already happening out there. It may not be officially sanctioned up until now. It may be a situation which has not been officially admitted to. But every child will receive the full curriculum. There is no diminution on that basis. And I think I have faith in schools where they're putting in place whatever arrangements they want to put in place to ensure, you know, schools have a great pastoral record, and I believe their ability to look after the education of all their children is something that, that I have faith in, and I believe that uh, the schools will um, deal with both that opportunity and the, that challenge that, 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 that lies ahead for them. Here I'm sir, Oliver McMullen. I call Oliver McMullen. I'm going to ask call you. Minister, can you, can you tell me if all school children who are entitled to school transport are indeed receiving school transport at this time? Uh, well, from that point of view, I know that there is fairly extensive school transport. Indeed, there are systems that if someone has been denied school transport when, um, when they feel rightly they should be receiving it, there is an appeals mechanism on that basis. Now, um, and in terms of home to school transport, at the moment it's about £75 million in the budget, so there is pretty extensive uh, school, home to school transport. Can I guarantee that uh, everybody who's entitled to it is claiming it, is getting it? To the best of my knowledge, that, that is the case. And indeed, there are appeals mechanisms within that. Can I guarantee that everybody who is potentially entitled to claim it claims it? I suspect it is not necessarily a case that there's universal claiming of, of any situation. And there will be different transport arrangements that some people will, will undergo in that, in that regard on it. But certainly, I would encourage anybody who's entitled to Take it up, take take that up. But I can't give a guarantee that that is universally 100 percent. Supplementary, Mr. McMahon. Can I thank the minister for for his answer so far? But can I ask the minister now? Will he resist all or any attempts by the education authority to reduce sc rural school transport in the future? School transport is a matter, uh, and I appreciate that there will be a wider context of looking at where budget lines are divided. School transport is under the authority of the education authority. They will ultimately take a degree of decisions. And I think what we've got to realise uh, within that, I think we want to protect all the various services as best as possible. But we are living in difficult financial positions. And particularly if, for example, we are trying to protect the very front line of the money going into aggregated schools budget, there will be certain pressures to make efficiencies within the education authority. Now, whether every decision that will be made will be the best decision, as indeed I'm sure there may be some who will argue that, that every decision that comes out of this House will not necessarily always be the best possible decision. But I think the, the maximum amount of protection does need to happen, but I'm not going to dictate necessarily then to, uh, to the Education Authority to say, you have a certain amount of money that you, that you have to save, here's precisely the way that you've got to save this, this money. Uh, I think there's got to be a degree of, of judgment, and indeed one of the advantages of the Education Authority um, is that as well as representatives of all sectors within, um, within society, the Education Authority Board now has that direct political dimension as well, which is that there are representatives of the four largest parties on the Education Authority. So there's a, a, a judgment call there that, that, that they will have to make. Can I give a guarantee that there won't be any change at all to school transport? No, I, I can't give that guarantee. But I hope that anything that is done across any sector is proportionate and actually protects the most vulnerable in our society. Here, I'm sorry, Catherine Seeley, called Catherine Thank you, Seeley. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to detail the number of schools currently operating with no sight of their 2016-17 final budget? Um, from that point of view, I think the, the budgets I think were sent out, as I understand it, all sort of ahead of the um, ahead of the school year, at least was I should say just before Easter. So I think that, that all schools should have got a final sighting in, in regard to that now. There is a particular arrangement with regard to special schools in terms of the education authority, and there's a different way of, that that is spent. 
But in terms of their, their final budget, all schools sh should have that. Now, the only issue is if, for example, as part of the process, I'm able to find some additional money to give support to schools, you know, that will impact in on their 16-17 budget. And I appreciate that that, at one level, creates a certain level of awkwardness for schools. On the other hand, I would prefer to be in the position that if I can do anything additional to help, I'll do it. But I don't want to keep schools feeling that there's some level of drip feed in terms of their, their finances. I think it's also very important, uh, as much as possible, and to be fair, we're caught within the wider circumstances of where the executive budget will be as well. It is also important, as much as possible, for schools to get an early sight of what their level of, of funding will be for next year, that that information is, is got out as, as quickly as possible, but that will be dependent upon what level of support that the department uh, gets from the, the executive. And as I'm sure the member realises, where I, I may have a particular bias to say I want to see as much funding as possible go into education, within the executive as a whole, there's going to be a wide range of, of pressures and very good things which, which the executive will want to sponsor. So it's a, it's a question also of what way the cake is divided up. Supplementary, Ms. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can I ask the Minister what engagement he has had with the Education Authority around special school budgets and the, the supposed time frame for those final drafts? Well, in terms of the direct bit of engagement with the range of issues with the uh, Education Authority, in terms of the detail of the special schools budgets, it's not something which there's been a direct conversation, but I, we're meeting the Education Authority fairly, fairly regularly on that basis. And if there are degrees of hold-ups in terms of the special schools budgets, I mean, one of the things as we look towards autonomy, need to be a greater consideration is what level of greater autonomy we can give, for example, and whether it's on a basis across the board or whether it's on the basis of a pilot basis. I think one of the things as a department we will need to look at is where the division is between funding directly for special schools as to what level of greater level of autonomy that they can be given. And I think we want to have something again that's fit for purpose that's there, and that's something also that will be in consideration as we move ahead. Um, can the Minister reassure the Irish medium sector that he hasn't got an agenda against the Irish language and that he will treat this sector fairly in the future? Yeah, I will be treating all sectors fairly. I will not be giving either discrimination against the sector or favourable treatment towards a, a sector. And therefore, all proposals are going to be judged against, uh, against the merits of that. So I'm happy to give that, that assurance to the member. Supplementary, Ms. Sheehan. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could he tell us how many development proposals from the Irish medium sector he has approved or rejected since he assumed office? Uh, there have been a f In terms of development proposals, I'd be happy to give the details to the, uh, to the member. I've treated each development proposal on its merits on that basis, and I think you know, we've got to look actually particularly, for instance, as we move towards a situation in area planning, that we actually have sustainability across all sectors. So I think that will mean actually there's got to be a degree of uh, discussion as to how best to deliver all the, for all the sectors on that, on that basis. But certainly I think we'll be happy to write to the member as regards the, uh, the detail of the number of, of development proposals that have been uh, put forward, dealt with, and um, the answer in each of those. I think that's a matter largely of public record. Okay, members, time is up for questions. If members just take their ease while we change the top table here. During uh, the economy uh, questions, so my apologies, uh, completely slipped my mind. Yeah, well, I don't know whether I'll take the, the Minister's recommendation on that, but Gurra Meogad Das Shinianu, thanks very much for doing that.